Sergei Zhirinov is a former KGB spy and former officer of the Russian Foreign Intelligence Service, SVR. He immigrated to France in the beginning of 1990s. While in service, he had few encounters with Putin and has a first-hand take on the Russian president traits. Zhirinov wrote a book about his work in KGB and exposed its corrupted ways. He has a YouTube channel and regularly gives his expert comments about current political events. He's a frequent guest on Ukrainian news shows. This interview was recorded on October 26, 2022. The United States, the UK and France rejected false allegations of Russia that Ukraine is preparing to use a so-called dirty bomb. A joint statement of the three countries was posted on the official website of the U.S. State Department. In this statement, they confirmed that defense ministers of each country spoke to Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. The ministers called the allegations transparently false. Western officials reject any pretext for escalation by Russia and will continue supporting Ukraine as long as it takes. Russian allegations to use a dirty bomb by Ukraine, uh, the world has to respond to it as fiercely as possible, as President Zelensky says. In his uh, video address, he said that uh, Minister Shoigu's statement actually proves that Russia itself has already prepared everything to use prohibited weapons. Today our guest is Sergei Zhirinov, a former KGB spy and a former officer of the Russian intelligence service, SVR. Hello, Sergei. Good evening. What do you think is behind uh, this Russian statement about a dirty bomb? I think you already answered this question. Western countries, uh, they suspect that Russia itself is preparing to use such a dirty bomb. But for our audience, I think we need to clarify what a dirty bomb is. There are nuclear weapons, and when the nuclear weapon explodes, as a result of it, uh, the radioactive substance is dissolved and all we have left only radiation. A dirty bomb is a conventional bomb somehow filled with radioactive materials that do not dissolve. A nuclear reaction, a nuclear explosion doesn't happen. It is a conventional explosion and as a result of it, uh, this uh, nuclear materials, nuclear waste that was filled, that bomb was filled with, uh, distributed across the territory. This is what happened in Chernobyl. In order to have a dirty bomb, you need to have uh, nuclear waste. And this waste could be found in uh, nuclear power stations, which produce such nuclear waste. It's just simple logic. What Ukraine does, Ukraine defends itself. You're fighting against an aggressor that came to your territory and you want to push them out of the territory. Ukraine doesn't have any reason to use a dirty bomb, let alone a nuclear weapon that you don't have because you gave away all your nuclear weapons to Russia in 1994. So in your territory you don't have it. It's your territory and you have no reason to pollute your own country with nuclear waste. But the aggressor has this motivation. That's why everything is pretty transparent. So what do you think is Putin capable of making such a decision and explode such a bomb? You know, we can expect anything from Putin. And I always recall Putin's evaluation that gave him in KGB Institute when he was not hired to the Foreign Intelligence Service. They wrote there that this person, I mean Putin, is capable of making decisions that he cannot calculate outcomes of. And those outcomes uh, can be dangerous for him and for the service itself. They didn't hire him, they sent him back to the system of counterintelligence in Leningrad, and then they sent him to KGB outpost in eastern Germany, and he didn't do any intelligence work. This characteristic actually tells you a lot about him. That's first thing. And secondly, Putin just in general, on the 21st of uh, February, 
when he made a decision to recognize these quasi-states of Lugansk and Donetsk republics, he made his main geopolitical mistake. Everything that he has been doing since then are mistakes. That's why he has no chance to win this war using conventional weapons. And the Ukrainian army proved it over eight months of the war. You proved that Russian army does not exist, that the Russian army is a parade army for parades on the Red Square. And when it has a real standoff with Ukrainian army that reformatted itself for the 21st century, a Russian army cannot win anything on the battlefield. Ukraine had one weakness uh, with equipment, and when it was compensated by the Western countries, it was clear right away that the Russian Federation cannot win in this war using conventional means, which means Putin has to use something else. And what is it? It is uh, Soviet mass destruction weapons, because if he did not have a nuclear shield, if he didn't have Soviet weapons, nuclear weapons, by now uh, Russia would be hit by NATO countries and Russian Federation as a military power would not exist. Uh, right now he's uh, covered and shielded only by this nuclear shield. And sadly, he has this deep illusion, and he proved it in his speech that he delivered on the 30th of September, uh, when uh, partly occupied uh, territories of Ukraine were annexed. Uh, he referred to the precedent uh, when Americans used uh, nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II. He quoted it, and he, uh, as a lawyer, is putting a legal ground for himself uh, to justify use of nuclear weapons. He understands if he's going to lose the war using conventional weapons, the only uh, thing he'll have to rely on will be nuclear weapons. Is he ready to do that or not? We cannot tell until we get to that point. But the evaluation he was given in KGB doesn't give us much optimism. And uh, Pentagon actually confirmed that Lloyd Austin uh, had talk with uh, Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu. And it, it is noted uh, that this phone call was initiated by uh, Russians. Uh, what these calls tell us about? What is behind them? I think interpretation of uh, the Russian rhetoric is pretty simple for experts in geopolitics and geostrategy. It's pretty simple. Russian side, including Putin, Lavrov, Peskov, Zakharova, all these officials, they simply lie. And when they blame foreign countries for some treacherous plans, as a rule, uh, they just uh, do the same. We need just reverse the statement. When Shoigu is saying that Ukraine is preparing to use a dirty bomb, it should be interpreted like this. Russia is preparing to use a dirty bomb. Because they always blame everybody around them for what they're doing themselves. When they're blaming you for committing war crimes, it means that Russia is committing war crimes. When they blame you, for destroying critical infrastructure, and it's demonstrated how they are bombing critical infrastructure in Ukraine. In terms of interpretation of their words, it's pretty simple, but the frequency of Shoigu's calls to, uh, to the UK, to Turkey, to France, uh, to the United States, tells us that they're preparing something. And also there is this interview of Surovikin, Sur commander of the front, when he said that he'll have to make some difficult decisions. And he also blamed Ukraine for preparing to use prohibited weapons. And I have to remind you that nuclear weapons are not 
prohibited weapons. Uh, prohibited weapons are chemical and uh, biological weapons or a dirty bomb. But is it possible that uh, by swinging uh, this nuclear stick uh, they're trying to make world leaders negotiate? Well, yes, uh, they started this blackmail from the very beginning and actually this blackmail shows us uh, Russia's weakness. Because clearly if uh, Russia had a strong army that can defeat somebody, then they didn't have to uh, threaten anybody with nuclear weapons. But they started doing it on the 27th of uh, February, on the third day of uh, the full-fledged uh, military operation in Ukraine. And it, uh, it was weakness on their side. And I have to tell you that economically Russian Federation is a dwarf. It's not a superpower. Its GDP is only 2-3% of the global GDP, and if we compare it uh, with uh, the US uh, GDP, it's 20% of global GDP, and the Chinese uh, GDP is 17% of global GDP. Russia doesn't have any resources for that, and actually Russia proved that it doesn't have any army. And since we can see that uh, Russia doesn't have an army on the battlefield, that actually increases the uh, probability uh, and danger that Russia may use other types of weapons, like weapons of mass destruction. President Zelensky uh, warned leaders of EU that Russians mined Kachovska uh, hydroelectric power station, and we know that uh, this hydro station uh, is connected with the Zaporozhye nuclear station, and uh, we know that it uh, powers it and uh, delivers water uh, to the nuclear station. If we look at it uh, from the military point of view, uh, which is quite cynical, and if they have a mission to accomplish, and this mission can be accomplished in different ways, and one of the ways can be destroying uh, civil infrastructure and always uh, destroying electrical infrastructure, it was, uh, it was always in plans of any war. They do imply to destroy significant infrastructure. And for this type of missions, uh, they developed a neutron bomb that does not make great destructions, but it destroys everything of electric nature uh, using electromagnetic impulse. It uh, dysfunction everything that is powered by electricity, railways, uh, and many other things. Uh, from the point of view of the military, they could make an argument that Ukraine uh, can explode Kakhovsk hydro station because uh, after that, that the wave that will go down the stream will destroy everything that is on the left bank of the river because your geographic structure is such that all rivers that flow from the north to the south their left bank is always lower than the right bank and that's why from the military point of view a reasoning could be found for Ukraine to explode it because this explosion could cut water supply to Crimea that goes through Dnieper uh, through the channel that near Kherson. Well, it's similar to the dirty bomb, right? So why would we do it if it's our territory? There is no any motivation for us. Well, you see from the military point of view, a motivation could be found. But you're absolutely right that, in fact, uh, Kachovsky Reservoir has a different purpose. Kachovsky Hydro Station supplies electricity to Zaporozhsky nuclear station because the nuclear station needs electricity to keep functioning and uh, that's why exploding Kachovsky power station meaning to dysfunction uh, nuclear station and actually nuclear station needs water for reactors to be cooled off. So this water from the reservoir should be delivered to the reactors. Without this water the existence of the uh, Zaporozhye nuclear station would be questionable. Right now the station is sh shut down, all reactors are shut down. But nevertheless, uh, n nuclear fuel should be cooled. 
even when the station doesn't work. And for you, it's a great problem. And you are on your territory. That's why there is no any logic and why Ukrainians should destroy their own territory. There might be an explanation if Russians would be attacking Ukraine right now, they would be inoffensive. And then we could recall the experience of World War II when uh, the retreating party would be destroying critical infrastructure so that Nazis wouldn't have it. But you are in a different position. You have a strategic advantage across the front line. You are taking back your territories. So there is no logic behind that. It's far-fetched argument that the Russia makes. You said that uh, Russians are terrorizing uh, Ukrainian cities and destroying critical infrastructure facilities. Uh, they're doing it using missiles and Iranian drones. Do you think Iran, like Belarus, will be involved in the war? And our intelligence actually reports uh, that uh, uh, dead Russian soldiers have Iranian bulletproof vests. Well, in fact, Iran has been involved in uh, Russian military projects for quite a while, since 2015, since Russian operation in Syria. Russia was uh, bombing uh, Syrian territory and uh, carrying out missile strikes from Iranian airfields. They've been cooperating like this for a while and it never stopped, including nuclear sphere. Putin, in fact, made a strategic mistake. He always said that Western countries are participating in the war because they supply you with weapons. And now when he needs weapons from Iran, thus he cancelled his own argument. Now he doesn't have it, because if he's buying drones from Iran, and they're talking not only about drones, but about uh, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles of short and medium range. Thus Iran becomes a participant or accessory in this war. Similar to Western countries, selling weapons doesn't make a country an accessory and also selling bulletproof vests doesn't make a country an accessory. But what about Iranian instructors uh, that help Russians to operate drones? Well, I have to tell you that uh, similar instructors from NATO you have on your territory and they've been there since 2014. They were training your army and it didn't make NATO countries uh, participants of the conflict. Well, but uh, Ukraine did not shoot at Russian territory. Yes, you're right. But uh, strictly speaking, an argument still can be made. So until these people with weapons fight, or if even there are foreigners with weapons in their hands, we need to look at the conditions uh, that they're fighting under, because in in your army there is a foreign legion and the volunteers from foreign countries that are defending Ukraine. Yes, but after signing a contract with the military forces of Ukraine. Yes, you're absolutely right. Here the legal part is very important. Uh, they have to wear, it, wear uniform, Ukrainian uniform, they need to find sign contracts and actually you have five battalions of Chechens. In other words, we need to look at what these people do, but the presence of instructors, technicians, so to speak, uh, that just help operate uh, military equipment, it doesn't make Iran a participant of the conflict. But I think we look at it from a different angle. This situation should be looked at differently. Russia uh, that presents itself as a great power that says that they don't need anyone, we can throw 
nuclear weapons all over the world and we have a cutting edge equipment that nobody has and all of a sudden Russia has to buy second-hand drones from the third world country it's laughable it's not that we need to reprimand Iran uh, that participates in military projects of Russia. But let's look at it this way. Where is this uh, superpower Russia that has to buy uh, weapons from such a th third world war country? Or buy it from Belarus? Because clearly you can't call Belarus or Iran a military power. Back to Russia. Uh, the uh, fight over the throne is getting hotter, especially after annexation of uh, Ukrainian regions. And Kirill Budanov, the head of Ukrainian intelligence service, said, and uh, the successor to the dictator uh, will be the first deputy head of presidential administration Sergei Kirienko. And how would you look at his chances there? And what are the chances to succeed the throne? I think all these talks about successors are quite meaningless in Putin's regime, because Putin sees himself only on the throne. The whole regime is built around Putin, though some experts don't agree with this point of view. They say there is some sort of collective Putin that is broader than Putin himself, and Putin regime can survive when Putin is gone. But I think when Putin is gone, his regime will be gone as well. That's my point of view. That's why I think Kirienka in particular doesn't really have any chances because in Russia they remember him as Kitty Surprise. He can be an official who runs a corporation who is now working in presidential administration, but he doesn't have any political weight, I would say zero. It's uh, hard to speak about political weight at all in Putin's regime. Not so many people have one. Uh, they say Patrushev might have one. But the, the same kind of happened with the uh, successors of Boris Yeltsin. There are many of them, but then Putin kind of popped up out of nowhere. Nobody knew him. He was just as kiddy surprise as Kirienko for Russians in 1999 and 2000. That's why I think all these talks are meaningless. And I think your intelligence does it right, that it launches these false reports to make all those guys in, in the Kremlin uh, fight with each other. All these reports about Bortnikov, Patrushev, Kadyrov, Prigozhin, I think you do it right. And when the Verkhovna Rada of Ukraine, the Ukrainian parliament, uh, when it recognized Chechen Republic Echkeria to be temporarily occupied by Russia and Chechen people who went through genocide by Russia. And I think by doing this, you launched a good mechanism of uh, collapsing Russia and against Kadyrov. Kadyrov is hated in Chechen Republic and I think it will help to dethrone him as well. And I think the Russian Federation in its current form will not exist in 5-10 years. It will uh, fall apart just like the Soviet Union. But actually I wouldn't support your argument about the fight over the throne because Kadyrov uh, made these provoking moves and I think this fight against uh, the towers, between the towers of the Kremlin uh, can end somehow. Thank you for your comments. Uh, uh, Sergei Zhirinov, uh, former KGB spy, uh, was with us. Thank you very much.